to jump in again, if I may. Please. Um, what another intriguing idea, I mean, there's been a lot of sci-fi films and done really, really well, and you hope to add something different or in addition to the genre instead of repeating. When James, another thing he hooked me with when he first, when he first started talking about this was he, um, he called on a quote that was attributed to Arthur Clarke, which said, I'm going to get it wrong right. so you can correct me, um, basically said, we're either not alone in the universe or we are completely and utterly alone. And either idea is equally frightening. And it, it, I can't think of any other film that actually, you know, we're usually dealing with either benevolent aliens who are going to impart some wisdom or some are going to destroy us and we have to stand up and fight. But this idea, this question of what if we are actually alone, um, at least in the, in, the, in the reachable universe through our lifetimes, what does that mean? And are we, are we missing something uh, between us? Yeah. That's true. No, that is true. We did try, we were trying to, to find new ground, new territory in it. We were. I mean, I, you know, we can talk about Apocalypse Now or Kubrick or whatever, but that is certainly the governing principle was, okay, we're going to make the first movie that, that might pose that question. Because it, it, to Brad's point, benevolent aliens or bad aliens, it's still an idea, in a sense, false gods, right? Kubrick beats the trap brilliantly. He's got these astronauts, they find us black slab on the moon that looks like some 60s minimalist sculpture. And you can project anything you want on it. Oh, there's good aliens, beta, I don't know what they are. It's just a black monolith floating around. E.T. E e beats the trap because he pitches it like a fable. So it's, it, I don't think you watch E.T. wanting a, a disquisition on alien life. You know, you, it's a, really what it is, is it's a lonely kid and dealing with a divorce. It's, that's really what it is, metaphor. Exactly. So um, we thought no false gods. Right. No one's going to save us. No little green man's going to help us out of climate change or anything like that. No, no bad alien's going to come and unify the whole planet, make us realize we're the same. Not coming. Not happening. What does that mean? Okay. Welcome to Movie Night Extravaganza. Um, I'm joined by uh, J. Andrew World, of course, as always, and uh, Lee Phillips, who is um, a science writer at Jacobin, um, among other things, and an author of... Uh, Two books. One that I've one that I've read and absolutely devoured and loved, which is People's Republic of Walmart. He's the co-author of that, and of um, Austerity Ecology and the uh, Collapse Porn Addicts. Um, so we are uh, we we're doing this a little bit differently tonight, I guess. Um, we don't always go into it with uh, someone having written something about the movie we're watching. So far, I don't think um, we've done that yet. So. You know, I, I asked like if, if there were sci-fi movies you wanted to watch to uh, discuss this or discuss you know sci-fi in general, and you sent me um, this this article that you wrote for Jacobin. What if we really are alone in the universe? Which is really the central question um, posed by Ad Astra, which is the movie that we watched. Um, so I guess I'll let you uh, talk about the the beginning of this um, right now and. Uh, and and really the, the most terrifying question asked in in a sci-fi movie i think personally you know what if we really are alone in the universe yeah. what if this is they're all what if this is all there is well so that clip that you you pulled up there um that's really interesting um uh i uh thought that this was this what the the main theme of this film was i didn't realize that I mean, I thought maybe that was my reading of it, uh, but that's interesting that that they literally that's that was their idea. Um, yeah, so that quote from from Arthur C. Clarke that Brad Pitt um, mangles there. Um, basically, the ending of the quote is that that both are equally terrifying. Um, if we we can understand why the discovery of other intelligent life forms in the in the universe would be terrifying, because then we'd be thinking, well. Um, what do they like? Will they eat us? Will they treat us like we treat, you know, cows or pigs or something like that? Um, will they come in peace? Um, that So there's a sort of terrifying idea there. Um, the other side, um, they're absolutely right. There's, there's almost nothing that I can think of really that's explored the other, the other 
side of, of, of the terror um, other than at Astra, where it, it really is, well, what if, what if it is just us? Um, that poses an enormous ethical burden on us to, to not kill ourselves and not wipe ourselves out. Because of course, a, un a universe with a, that is unaware of itself, um, there's, there's no purpose to the universe. We are, uh, we are moral agents in, a, in an amoral world. Um, if there's nothing else in the universe that is a moral agent, we are the only moral agents in the world. And doing a um, banger job it, of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'm more humanist. I'm more optimistic than I think a lot of people. But um, um, it, it, it places this enormous burden on us not to screw things up with climate change and wipe us out. But um, I mean, this goes along with the sort of line, you know, from Stephen Jay Gould, the uh, the paleontologist, the late paleontologist, and 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 socialist, and he made this argument, and which I think I find very compelling, which is. Uh, that the you know life on Earth is incredibly robust. It's not fragile at all. We're not in the business of saving the planet when we're talking about climate change or biodiversity loss. What we're talking about is saving ourselves. We are what's fragile. Mm -hmm. We're the special thing. We're quite exceptional. Um, yeah. So I think that's the 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 the, uh, the terror that they're they're talking about. That and it's profoundly important in the current moment. Uh, given the the, you know, the state of the planet with respect to climate change and biodiversity loss, but also from a technical point of view, in that um, this isn't just a an interesting philosophical speculation. We are at a very very interesting point um, scientifically, where within the next four or five years, we will have you know the next generation of of long range uh, sort of deep space satellites, uh, which will be able to um uh, sort of assess the um uh, the, the sort of whether there are biosignatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets we already have about you know i think it's on the order of about 4000 exoplanets that we've discovered but we mainly discovered them through sort of um transit in front of their their suns um uh, when there's a dip in the uh the, the light that comes from that that star we we know that there's there's a there's a there's a planet there, and we can use that information to assess its size and so on and so forth. But what we can't do, or we haven't been able to do very very well, other than some extremely close um, exoplanets, and I think it's a, just a handful. We can't directly observe it. And the next generation of, of of satellites will be able to directly observe these these planets, these exoplanets, and as a result of that, assess what's in their atmosphere. And from the the sort of um, uh, the sort of light signatures from the the, uh, the chemicals in the atmosphere, we're able to, we should be able to assess um, whether there is life or not, or rather put it another way, there are certain chemicals that it is um, much more likely that at certain volumes, um, life creates rather than um, non-life. And as a result of that, and I'll wrap up in a second, um, we should be able to uh, map quite large areas of the uh, of the galaxy uh, that way, which then gives us a sort of statistical assessment of how many how how frequent um, these 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 biosignatures are on other planets, and if it's one in every four thousand um, um, exoplanets, um, then we've got a good sense of like how common life is. But if we find nothing at all. Um, that that's that tells us that we are the only um, life, uh, at least in the galaxy, uh, mm -hmm. because statistically, uh, even though we can't map the entirety of the galaxy, statistically that should tell us um, how common life is. Five, ten years or so, we we, we should, in principle, have a, a sense of how how likely life is on other other worlds, which is very scary. Yeah. And amazing at the same time. Yeah. And and um, what I guess my question um, about this is, you know, there's kind of like the, the Goldilocks planet theory that, you know, like we're, we're always looking for livable planets, I guess. Um, Goldilocks zone. Yes. Yeah. So what what uh, what factors, I guess, more exactly make up that um, that concept? Like what what makes a planet, I guess, technically livable or technically able to house life like life? One of the primary things is you want a temperature range where you have um uh, liquid water, because liquid water is just so um, essential for so many different uh, life processes, or rather, 
processes for life as we know it. Yeah, that's the sort. So you, you um, too hot, um, you you won't have um, a liquid water. Too cold, all the water's frozen. But having said that, um, that doesn't necessarily mean a particular distance from the sun, um, a sort of Goldilocks zone. Although we have historically thought about that. More recently, we've sort of, um, well, not recently, it's been a while since we've sort of assessed these sort of possibilities, but uh, you could be farther away from the sun so that all water on the surface of a, of a world is, is frozen. But if there's water inside, it might, or, um, uh, it might continue to be liquid if it's heated by the, um, uh, so the radiation from the, uh, the, the core or, or mantle of the, um, that planet. Um, so, I, so we're, so we're looking right now at, at, you know, the entire universe. Sorry, I, there are um, lots of other aspects, but that's yeah. what the main ones. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I, I was just, I was just curious. There was like, I, I knew about the, the temperature range part of it. I, I was just, I was curious if there was parts of it. I didn't really, um, it, the, like, I don't know. Cause you know, there's just a lot of times there's so many factors that are so in depth and, um, on the, well, yeah, no, this is a really good point because on the other end of, uh, the other end of this, other, another part of the discussion. Um, um, for a long time, we would, and we still do, like if you take a, a biology, uh, an undergraduate biology course, you're going to be learning that there are certain limits, um, at, uh, but not just in terms of temperature, but acidity, uh, later level of radioactivity or alkalinity, uh, pressure, uh, there's a range of other conditions, which are at the edges of which, you know, sort of extreme versions of this, and uh, life is ruled out. The problem is that um, within microbiology, uh, there's been a raft of discoveries in the last uh, couple of decades where uh, we go to some sort of ecosystem which is extraordinarily salty or extraordinarily acidic or extraordinarily radioactive or the vacuum of space or um, like in incredible pressures where we had historically assumed there is no uh, possible way that life can be there. We go there and we find extreme files. Um, and uh, researchers, for the most part, you will still, people will uh, still assert that there are, there are limits, but there are researchers who, will be in who are beginning to say that there might not be limits. I mean, it's certainly the, the biodiversity in those, in those conditions is extremely low. Um, but we're wondering whether is there any part where uh, we ab find absolutely nothing. Yeah. And that's that's kind of interesting because that's actually much more optimistic. That suggests that um, life is should be almost everywhere, uh, just a very where in these sort of extreme conditions it would be extremely extremely low, um, but that it might might just be everywhere that biology is just a, um, um, a consequence of chemistry. And, and kind of, I think, um, you know, like, I don't remember if we were, uh, recording yet when, when Andy made this joke about the tardigrades, um, tardigrades, like the, yes. Tardigrades. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the, like, but Water that kind is. of, yeah, <laughs> but, but like, you know, the fact that they can kind of survive in, in these, you know, uh, low oxygen conditions, it, it kind of says that like, maybe, maybe not, maybe, there's certain uh, things that intelligent life can't develop, but then you think about it and like, what is intelligence? What is life? Um, like, you know what I mean? Like the, 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 these factors I think start to go away um, a little bit, or you can theorize that these factors start to go away because of, you know, the enormous amount of life that survived here in different conditions. And we're kind of only judging it by what's, what we can prove survived here. Like I just, I could yeah. see like a, an incredibly, optimistic person saying like well how do we know that those are the same conditions that um you know like like anywhere else like it's kind of an, an endless theory yeah. because there's an endless amount of possibilities yeah uh, and that's a uh, simple size of one the uh, earth is our only yeah only data point and and that's, that's within, but as i say in the next couple of years in a couple of five to ten years we will have many more data points yeah all right so that's that's really interesting that point is coming up uh pretty fast considering i think how fast how how big the gap is sometimes between uh you know like space discovery i feel like we find out something and then it's like 10 years before or 20 years or you know what i mean like it, it takes a long time because 
I mean, when you really think about where we've actually been able to go, it's just really the moon. Like, and, and it's been... Oh, no, no. I mean, it depends what you mean by we, um, like, in terms of manned space exploration. Yes, the moon is the only place. Yeah, I mean... Talking I, about I mean, where humanity has gone as a whole through robotic exploration, we've gone beyond the edge of the, uh, the solar system. We've, no, I, uh, I meant, I meant like... Past like, the, the heliosphere. Yeah, I meant man physically walking on on a on a space or you know visiting a space um right. no no pun intended i guess <laughs> um um so another thing that you go into into in this article is uh the loneliness of space capitalism and um i i think it's fascinating that this movie kind of uh which is something that you know i kind of made the theory like i, I messaged both of you earlier about the theory that this is kind of like to uh kubrick movies especially 2001 what uh what the joker was to scorsese movies like <clears throat> it's kind of a, an ongoing homage or like homage throughout the entire uh like like two hours to a series of different movies but like i think 2001 a space odyssey is the one that most um that most reflects that and you can see that in in the fact that they really did use the arthur c clark uh quote when they're talking about where, where they came up with the idea who you know yeah. is the co-writer of among you know numerous other science fiction uh works but you know, he was chosen as the co-writer of, um, of 2001. And on top of that, um, when I was watching interviews with, uh, with James Gray last night, who's the director of this, he said a very similar, um, a very similar point, uh, to what Arthur C. Clarke had said, uh, which is that, or a very similar goal, I guess. The, the goal of this movie was to be the most accurate, um, space e exploration movie ever conceived. And, uh, that's the same thing that, that Kubrick and, uh, Arthur C. Clarke put out as their goal when they first made 2001. Um, so I guess the, the space capitalism point I wanted to compare the uh, scenes from the two movies that are like very, very, very similar scenes doing, doing, I think exactly the same thing. And uh, so I thought this would be a good place to set it up from. We remind you the moon is borderless. Many mining zones are disputed territory and considered to be in a state of war. Please stay within the restricted safe area. Excuse me. May I have the blanket and pillow back, please? Sure. $125. Thank you. Thank you. All the hopes we ever had for space travel. Covered up by drink stands and t-shirt vendors. Just a recreation of what we're running from on Earth. We are world eaters. If my dad could see this now, he'd tear it all down. Yeah, so I think that, you know, in, in, in both of those cases, um, not only, not only, obviously, is there still is there the you know the assumption that in this new um, space exploration age there will still be the same like you know companies and, and corporate branding everywhere, um, but on top of that, the, the, it's very mundane. Like space yeah. travel, all of a sudden, is not something that's seen as like this this great star projecting like thing that uh, really is like um, I don't know just, just really majestic uh, scientific exploration. I mean, in both cases, it is, but. At the same time, it's also like this very mundane, almost like plane travel uh, situation. I actually kind of got a big uh, Outland vibe, which uh, is a fantastic movie. Sean Connery uh, came out in the early 80s. Uh, a lot of people compare it to Alien, but without the Alien, uh, if, if you've never seen it before. It's uh, basically a Western set on the frontier of space where there's a mining colony. And Sean Connery has to basically investigate drug dealers. It's it's a fantastic movie, uh, and it just happens to be set in space. I mean that that's really the big thing. But but a lot of this space capitalism idea isn't new. It's just the, new the way it's presented because in 1982, I want to say, whenever Outland came out, um, you know, uh, we didn't have the the same kind of branding or, or brand recognition as we started to get towards the end of the 80s into the 90s, uh, which, which you know, led to Naomi Klein's first book, if you've ever read that. Uh, was it No Labels, I think? No Logo, yes. No Logo, and that's I it. I don't like the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but the thing is, though, is that that idea came up from the uh, intense branding that you saw there on the moon, whereas Outland, which, you know, came out, you know, uh, basically at the beginning of the 80s, before that kind of branding really was uh, as commonplace. It was 
it was there, but not, you know, not, not to the same degree. Um, and, and uh, so you didn't necessarily see like a shopping mall uh, there, even though it could have easily have done that. It, it uh, would have actually linked very well to the, to the film if you've ever actually seen that. And I kind of, I, I said to Forrest, uh, well, uh, you know, the reason why I bring up Outland is I didn't feel that this was a, a uh, nod to 2001. Um, there, there was, there was, a, there wasn't the dancing of the, uh, of the, uh, of the spaceships like, like uh, Kubrick did. And that's the first thing I think of whenever I think of 2001, I was thinking uh, more of Outland, uh, you know, with that, with that gritty realism, not quite as that, that lived in dirty, you know, but that's, that's a whole other movie, but yeah. I, I think that, yeah, point is very well taken there. Uh, I was actually kind of surprised actually, um, it's been years since I've seen uh, 2001. I was actually quite surprised uh, by the the presence there of the uh, Howard Johnson's uh, the Hojo logo there, um, <laughs> because um, so much of 2001 is sort of extra capitalism, like beyond it, and yeah. not quite in the same way that say Star Trek was, um, where you know Star Trek exists in a universe where, um, uh, or certainly with on Earth. Um, and within the Federation, um, capitalism has been transcended. Um, everybody just does things because it's in, you know, they're interested in doing it. Um, and uh, I, I, I tend to think that a lot of the, the sort of the gritty capitalist realism, um, or yeah, gritty realism of, of the representation of capitalism in, in films like um like this or the expanse or um even you know blade runner which is also i think it was 1980 81 yeah, um, i think that was 82 as well if 82? i remember correctly okay all of these exist within the post um uh so sort of the neoliberal era like after the uh, uh the you know what the french called the 30 glorious, 30 glorious years of the welfare state the post war sort of social democratic consensus um which is you know primarily well, not primary, but very, very much state driven. There's very large public sector, strong trade unions. We, we you know, the three of us all know that the story there. Um, and 2001 is set with, or like, or rather made, not set, but made within that period. Um, so I would have expected, that's why I find the Howard Johnson thing to be so surprising there that it's already sort of within um, this vision of, of space that it is um, commodified. Uh, capitalized. Um, uh, and part of this, I think, basically comes down to the fact that, you know, the, the, the world historic defeat of working people and our, and our organizations, particularly the trade unions in the late 70s, early 80s, as a result of the neoliberal revolution, um, creates, you know, what the philosopher Mark, Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, not merely that we can't, um, we've resigned ourselves to capitalism as there be, being no other way, uh, but we can't even conceive of there being anything beyond capitalism and that capitalist realism thus infuses our, our science fiction of course um uh, there would be exploitation and commodification and uh you know capitalist relations uh, in space we can't imagine that there wouldn't be uh, a star trek uh, of uh, post-capitalist star trek couldn't be made today yeah um, well, I, I think what, what uh, at least, because I don't think Kubrick really got interviewed too much on the making of 2001, but Arthur C. Clarke was everywhere for, you know, his, yeah. his entire life, like constantly interviewed, loved being in front of the camera. So I, I was watching a couple weeks ago, we were going to do for Ben's show 2001, and then we didn't end up doing it. But I was watching that and I watched the making of documentary and he was talking about the writing process. They imagined that, uh, you know, Space Station 5 would be like an airport. So they were looking at like, you know, replications of, of what was what, what, like what actual airports look like. And obviously, you know, airports are some of the first uh, first things to be commodified and branded um, with, with all those logos, like, you know, brought to you by Howard Johnson's brought to you by, you know, Bell Telephone. Like those are those are the first places that kind of were able to like sell off uh, parts of themselves in order to pay for it. Because, you know, I mean, it's just it's supposed to be a lounge. Like, what do you like? You're not going to have like. I mean, you know, they're private companies anyway, but you're not going to have like a private company lounge. Like you're going to have brands in it. You're going to have people like, you know, sitting there and, and being able to talk on uh, like pay phones, like all of that stuff. So it, it definitely feels, it's definitely really interesting that it, uh, it kind of guessed that space would be like this because NASA now is selling um, on the international space station, obviously, like <coughs> they accepted tons of money from uh, companies to brand things on it. 
So it kind of feels like, I, know. I guess, life imitating art in that way. <laughs> it's very sad. It's very, very sad. I don't know if you have seen, but there's this clip from about maybe 10 years ago, maybe um, eight years ago or so. It was just, bef it wasn't long before um, Neil Armstrong died. And he's interviewed by 60 Minutes. I think it was six. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 60 Minutes. Um, uh, about his opinion about the new commercialization of space that was just getting going at that point. And he's mainly sort of referring to sort of Elon Musk. And, um, oh, no, sorry, it's the other way around. It's not that um, uh, Armstrong is interviewed. Elon Musk is interviewed about Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong makes a comment. Uh, I think he's... he's, he's uh, He's testifying before Congress. Um, basically, he's arguing against, Neil Armstrong is arguing against the commercialization of space. And 60 Minutes asked Elon Musk, so, you know, what do you think about this? This is, you know, Neil Armstrong is, is your great hero, one of your great heroes. What do you feel about him saying that space shouldn't be commodified, that it shouldn't be um, uh, for profit? Um, and and Elon Musk has a sort of little, his eyes get sort of teary and, <laughs> and so very happy at Elon Musk crying at Neil Armstrong um, telling this billionaire that um, space needs to be a public sector endeavor. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that becomes hard, though, is, is, you know, the enormous budgets of NASA projects, the enormous budget of going to anywhere in space, really, like, you know, any building new technology is extraordinarily expensive. And in a time when we're kind of living in a in, in global austerity, um, yeah these things get huge grants, but at the same time, like all of a sudden it starts, you know, NASA starts looking for funding from other places or the space station or whatever yeah. it is, huge projects. And the first people to like want to be part of that are like McDonald's, like, you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. you can see that with now, like they even had like the DHS, uh, the, the, the photo company that's just at the, in, in, that, in that Astra, like that's just in the, the space station. Yeah, um, DHL, so, yeah. But, but then at the same time, it kind of turns it all into a, a replication of what's happening on earth, like everywhere, you know, like, we're not even we're not even at an age where uh you know there's a country that doesn't have a mcdonald's in it. and um so when so when james gray was being um interviewed uh i was watching it and he he's, he's talking about ad astra and and wanting to be as realistic quote unquote as possible which means you know wanting to replicate the same systems that we have here on earth and to make point like he's definitely talking about it and you have a great quote in uh that you found in in your article that he said um about you know it's no longer uh, a, a Wait, I'm going to find it. But um, so he's talking about it's no longer, you know, a battle between uh, Russia and the U.S. We've kind of come to this consensus. And um, hold on. Well, anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, Gray's critique is indeed one that laments what capitalism is doing, as we know from his comments to the press. If we were having this conversation in 1960, we could talk about the counterweight of the communist or socialist dictatorship bloc. Today, there's not really a counterweight to market capitalism. He told CNET, it's an unstoppable yeah. force. In the developed nations, the gap between the richest and poorest is growing ever larger. And why would we project that? Why would that we wait? Why would we project that space would be any different? Um, so, yeah, so we know from that from that quote that it isn't just a bit of color in the way that it is for maybe for some other science fiction films. It, it, it's deliberately there. It is a critique. And you get that with the, the line that um, uh, Roy McBride, the Brad Pitt character, uh, says, as you see him. You know, going through, you know, past the DHL shop and stuff like that, that his dad would have hated it. Uh, he would have torn it all down. Yeah, well, and and that's, I mean, so so much of this movie, I feel like, I, I think this brings us to a to an interesting point of it. So much of this movie, his father is obviously looming large over him as a space explorer, a space conqueror, I would say, uh, more than anything. You know, he's kind of, like, the project that he's working on, trying to contact aliens and like building this this community it seems like almost like an imperialist project i'd say like, you know, like why um well this his attitude towards it it seems a lot like you know I, i'm not necessarily saying that he's an imperialist but number one he's a brutal dictator on a ship he, he ends up murdering everybody he, in yeah. service of this bigger goal and number two it seems a lot like the the you know the age of exploration he doesn't ultimately find what he's looking for but it doesn't seem to be in service of capital as much as it seems in service of uh, some form of, of of scientific research that's going to lead to conquest most likely I, I mean okay i think this is a really important uh point to bring up and i'm sorry that i'm speaking too much and i'll 
So the Andrew is. I'm like, loving this. I, I, yeah, yeah no, you're, you're. I'm just like this is this is freaking awesome, man. Okay. Your, your commentary on this is far more interesting than anything we would have talked about. I think. <laughs> I, I'd be uh, saying everybody's mermaids if, if it was just me talking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a reference. To, we talked to Doug Lane earlier, um, and he had uh, we we watched this movie, and and Andy was like, at the end of it, I think everyone turned out to be mermaids. And Douglas was like, "What the fuck?" Like, <laughs> no, but like, you totally watch that movie and get that 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 uh, interpretation of it. But that's all other. I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I sorry. was just going to no. say that I think we need to be able to distinguish. Certainly, as socialists, we need to be able to distinguish between um, scientific exploration and discovery from conquest or imperialism or colonialism or that that package of things. Um, uh, certainly. You can't have colonialism without discovery, without exploration. But one can imagine a world where we just go off and explore without the the, the domination, without the imperialism, without the colonialism. The only reason you would really? have that is if you have a sort of um, um, a class system that, and, and certainly a market system that, that requires um, extended um, in, increase in profits and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, if you have a system where you don't do that, you have a system like uh, exists potentially in Star Trek, where there is no uh, conception of um, imperialism or conquest. It's just pure discovery for its own sake. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't inherently believe that you know uh, exploration has to be imperialist. My my comment on that character specifically is the extremely uh, authoritarian and violent impulses he seems to have towards his own crew. Um, you know, uh, in service of this mission, I, I I don't think I think there could be a, a highly benevolent person who just doesn't find life and keeps exploring, and then his crew wants to go back yeah. and, and they bail, and then you know, like so. I think that kind of person definitely can exist. I'm just saying this person seems like a number one single minded, but number two, like considering the violent the, the violent end he gives to his own crew in service of continuing this research. It, it, I, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily think. No, that this, no. I think that's a valid you know. reading. I think that's totally a valid reading. I, I simply took his um, uh, his murderous behavior towards his crew when they mutinied. Uh, what, I mean, b as an expression of um, how committed he is to um, to exploration and discovery. Um, Especially in the face of he, he in fact, he basically has faith that there is life elsewhere. There has to be. So in many respects, he's not being very scientific. He wants to prove his his hypothesis rather yeah, than before, test his yeah. hypothesis. Um, I think that's that's interesting. Um, he so loves his subject uh, that he, he's 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 willing to kill his 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 crew for it. Um, I don't take it as a reading necessarily that that automatically translates into colonialism or imperialism or conquest. Um, uh, I just think it's, he's so irrationally committed to proving his hypothesis there. Um, and the reason I say some of this stuff is because his, uh, because James Gray's earlier film, uh, The Lost City of Zed, have you guys seen that? Or Z, as he would say in the United States? No, I remember when it came out, I didn't end up, I didn't end up watching it. It's a brilliant film. It's an amazing, oh. I, I, I heard good things about it after it came out. That's different. Story. Um, so it is about the age of exploration and colonialism. And um, I think it's quite clear in, in the lost city of Zed. There's supposed to be this lost city in, um, in, in South America. And um, uh, there are figures who are explorers and uh, scientists who are very clearly colonial. And then there are other, uh, the, so the main characters, the main two characters, um, uh, Charlie Hunnam and Robert Pattinson are figures who are just explorers for their own sake. And the film in many respects, the main theme of the film, or one of the main themes of the film, is this distinction between exploration for um, conquest um, and exploration, scientific exploration for its own sake, and and their their antagonism. So I think yeah. that's a and, that's and he kind of he does that. he does make that distinction in this too. Um, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I, he doesn't make that distinction in this too. I think um, when he pretty much shows that Spacecom itself is a colonial, uh, 
a colonial operator in the sense of on the moon, on Mars, and uh, on the space station, all of these places, um, we're like still at war for natural resources. Like it, it's, it, we're replicating exactly the same systems everywhere else that we have here. Um, I'm going to make an argument saying that you can't have benevolent uh, exploration without, you know, with the, with still having the needs to of extractive resources like oil or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, Star Trek is actually interesting because like they, they still have an extractive resource with the dilithium crystals. I mean, if you yeah. watch the last season of discovery, that's really what the whole season was about. And it's like, why can't we come up with, I mean, I know like, you, you know, whenever energy changes form, it loses quality, but like, like, couldn't there be like ways to like uh, hit, do trans warp drive through solar winds and stuff like that? I don't know. I'm just, you know. No, I mean it's a fundamental contradiction within the within the myth mythos of the series is that what enables them to be a post capitalist society isn't a revolution, although it's a little bit vague exactly how that comes about because there's a third world war. But primarily, it's the development of replicators. Um, but then, if you have if the replicators that can create anything out of just <clears throat> reconstituting <clears throat> other atoms, other molecules. Um, but if you can do that, why can't you just create new dilithium crystals? Why do you need to extract them? Uh, so I think there's a contradiction there within it. But that <clears throat> all sort of science fiction and sort of speculative stuff, ultimately, you know, if you look too closely at it, you will find some some sort of contradictions there. Just don't but, let a don't let a pothole ruin a good time, you know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually disagree. I would say that there's nothing wrong with extraction at all, so long as it isn't uh, for profit. Um, one can imagine a an extractive process um, without profit if the only purpose you would be doing that is for the betterment of human society. Um, including the ecosystems that uh, deliver its um, uh, you know, e uh, ecosystem services upon which you know humans flourish, human flourishing depends. Um, if through the process of extraction <clears throat> or some extractive processes you undermine that flourishing, well, because you're a democratic, non-profit driven society, you just decide that you won't do that. Yeah, um, but it's, I mean, that's within if that's what if you're extracting within your own borders, I mean, you know, adding another. Like, let's say you added another group uh, or something to that process. Like, if you did discover aliens and you started extracting from them, even if it's not for profit, you know, that could still turn into an imperialist. Uh, but the crucial claim about socialism, or at least like full communism or like one day, is that it isn't uh, nation based, that it is everybody. And so um, if you discover some more parts of everybody in the universe, you don't set up a border, you they they are yeah. automatically extended as part of your uh, the realm of of um, of ethical concern. And I guess I guess what I'll say about um, I, I'm not I don't disagree, but this is a point I wanted to bring up about both 2001 and about Ad Astra is that we've kind of it seems like in Ad Astra nations still seem to be uh, fighting over resources, but yeah. it kind of feels like in a lot of these cases um, space exploration has kind of. Uh, transcended borders on our specific planet. Um, so in 2001, especially, it seems like there's a world government yeah. of some form that's, that's because, you know, I mean, even if play, like different nations have their own, uh, you know, have their own places, it still, it still seems like there's a, uh, you know, a, um, it's, it still seems like there's some kind of uh, world government that, that governs these things. Like all, all the characters, at least in 2001 have like different accents. Um, you know, seem to be from different places. So I, I don't know. I, I thought that was interesting. It's the this idea. Was that... the, this was the presumption in the uh, post-war period that um, we would steadily develop towards a sort of world government, that there would be world peace, and that um, um, uh, I mean, certainly within um, from uh, socialists and communists, the idea was, you know, l'intel national, the the international would be the whole world it wouldn't be socialism in different countries but ultimately it would be everywhere and liberals also sort of adhere to that uh, if perhaps a little bit more sort of uh, figuring it would take a bit longer to achieve something like that but that was that was part of the worldview today um we regularly stumble across uh, conceptions of um even on the the far left um just assuming that there will still be nations after we build socialism um i think it's another spe as a, another species of capitalist realism 
imagining that there can't possibly be a world government. I was, uh, I've, I've been listening to a lot of um, books about the CIA and I was listening to uh, the devil's chessboard is the, is the one I'm listening to right now. And they go into the, the Bretton Woods conference and like the dream that, um, and of course that wouldn't have been, I mean, th this conception of it would have still been a, an incredibly uh, unequal um, sure. world, but like, but there still was this belief that, you know, FDR had that, became the World Bank and IMF. And then, you know, once the intelligence service kind of took that over, became a, an, ex, an extremely uh, destructive force. But like FDR kind of originally thought of that as like almost like a utopian outside of um, world government yeah. kind of force, like a new world order. Um, and then it kind of was tanked very quickly by, you know, the Dulles brothers and um, all of the, all and, and you know, Nixon, McCarthy, and like all of the different, um, uh, you know, forces that really wanted to have the Cold War happen. When yeah, we, I mean, we shouldn't sort of overstate how um, sort of benevolent FDR was, but certainly the impulse between uh, sort of at the outset of the Bret Bretton Woods organizations was to try to um, make sure that the financial or economic um, uh, instability that played such a huge role in kicking off, you know, the rise of fascism, the Second World War, the Holocaust, that we wouldn't ever do that again. And to ensure that uh, wouldn't happen ever again, we had to have these sort of institutions that more carefully um, uh, sort of monitor the, sort of the global uh, financial situation. As you say, within you know fairly uh, you know a short order, uh, this was used as an instrument of American um, imperialism rather than the more that sort of that moment of um, sort of liberal internationalism didn't really last for for long. Yeah. So uh, I got a question. It certainly was there. I, I was just going to say, if uh, I was just wondering, like, um, you know, we, we were kind of, you kind of divided the the films between like before neoliberalism, you know, the era of neoliberalism and, and after. Um, what would you say about like the '70s? Certainly had a, a different take in sci-fi in general, with uh, like the the uh, rise of lifeboat uh, kind yeah. of. Um, uh, uh, I, for, I forget the exact term, but like, like uh, you know, there's the uh, spaceship Earth concept yeah, like and, and running out of yeah. like uh, different things because you had like uh, uh, Z ZPG and uh, yeah. uh, um, Soil and Green and, and uh, yeah. all, all those, uh, you know, classic they're films like that. It, and they, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're not of the neoliberal era, but they're also not of this uh, post-war. Uh, yeah. and, and do you think that kind of also like... Uh, led into the neoliberalism area uh, era of the um sorry i haven't quite fully thought out this question no so, it's a great question um, um yeah you see where i'm going though right totally uh, okay so it's it's useful historically to to sort of draw a line in the sand and say um you know 1973 you have the oil crisis this is the beginning of the new uh, neoliberal era before that everything was you know um Keynesian welfare state, everything's tickety boo. That's not how the real world works. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's more there's more of a gradation than that. Uh, nevertheless, we there is some utility in marking a distinction between the broad trends um, in the West, uh, in the post-war period, and the broad trends after that. And the 1970s are that sort of transition period. So it's not surprising that there would be some sort of mixture of these sorts of ideas. It's not fully neoliberal yet. But it's not sort of they're all, they're definitely going through the the real ructions and and uh, sort of te yeah tectonic sort of ructions with respect to the 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 the, the breakdown of the post war consensus. Um, we see that in terms of uh, the quite r radical uh, increase in in in, in class struggles sort of almost violent um, in many countries. Italy in the uh, in 1977 sort of the, the hot autumn in Italy. Was, was was extremely violent um, sort of reactions to trying to pull apart the um, the post-war consensus. Um, but also at this this period by the late late 60s, we are getting much more of a an awareness from science of um, uh, some of the ecological challenges that we were, we were facing, um, particularly with respect to pollution, Pl um, acid rain, um, not really plastic pollution yet, but um, some of the synthetic chemicals that have been developed in the post-war period. And there were two sort of response, possible responses to this. One was a sort of Malthusian response to this, uh, which has, 
you know, try calling for the end to end to growth and to population growth. Um, and had some very, very, very dark edges to that with respect to closing the borders. Um, uh, really, really nasty, quite racist comments with respect to, you know, there's, you know, um, so many people in, in Calcutta that are just swarming over each other, just even use words like swarm and um, pretty, gro pretty gross, grotesque. And this was in the heart of people like the Sierra Club, a big mainstream green organization. Um, and then there was a more sort of working class, a socialist perspective that rejected Malthusianism. They said, no, 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 no. The, uh, there's nothing wrong with people. There can never be too many people. Uh, there can never be too much stuff. Uh, the question is market relations. That's the uh, class relations. That's that's the fundamental challenge that we face. That there is a, if a company produces something that we that science tells us now discovers that is is harmful uh, to the environment um, and thus to us, uh, then there continues to be an incentive for that private company to continue to produce that even after we discovered it's a problem. Um, whereas if you have a, um, um, a sort of a socialist system, if you discover, if your scientists discover that there's this, this bad commodity, it's much more easy for you to say, well, we'll just stop production of this. It may be a useful commodity, but uh, so there might be still be some issues with how long it takes for you to, to, to shut off production of that commodity, but at least there isn't any sort of incentive anymore um, from a private actor to, uh, you know, by lobbyists to try to change uh, the, the minds of the, uh, the elected representatives or uh, to put out ads that basically lie about the, uh, the safety of that particular commodity, the way that we do. Uh, I, think, and I, I think, I think that, um, that like the point that you're making right now is why I devoured uh, People's Republic of Walmart so, so voraciously when I, when I, um, read it last summer was the conception of socialism not as a brand new uh not as a brand new necessarily economic apparatus in the sense of like the, the things that already exist suddenly disappearing and you know no like consumer goods disappearing and all this yeah. stuff which is something that obviously we get accused of all the time as democratic socialists like oh you really want to create a, a society where um where we can't get this 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 and this i i was i was just blown away by your conception of it as a um and your co-author's conception of it as a as a series of distribution centers, and of course, um, one of the one of the most interesting ones is Allende's uh, computer project in, in Chile before he was Cyber overthrown. Center, yeah. yeah. So, but but even just you know um, things like Walmart still you know having a distribution chain that solves a lot of these economic issues, and suddenly socialism becomes not just um, not just you know all right, well we're going to give you know money money all around like redistribute wealth. But the goods can actually be distributed a different way, and that's really what we're looking to do. Um, because you know, it really you are you start arguing with someone who considers themselves a capitalist, which I think is a dumb thing to consider yourself if you don't own any property or a company or anything. Like you're just you're kind of just uh, a status quo warrior. You're not necessarily a capitalist, but you know, I'll I'll call them capitalists. Um, constantly argue, and they're like, oh well, you don't want anyone to have anything. You want everyone to starve, and it's like. Every everything already exists though. Like it's not like the TVs suddenly vanish and, and the consumer products suddenly vanish. I mean, you know, the 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 manufacture and, and production are gonna change, I'm sure, but like it, it doesn't have to necessarily be that all consumer goods disappear. Like what the fuck do you think is gonna happen to them? Do you think we're gonna just explode like send them to the moon? Like we're like, all right, no more for anyone else. I mean, I think we we probably could imagine if we were democratically deciding production in society that we probably would democratically choose a different suite a suite of many different products some of them will be the same we're still going to be producing underwear and we're still going to be producing uh, uh craft beer and all these 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 sorts of things but uh, oh maybe maybe, maybe then um, maybe i need a, a different a different thing then if we're going to keep producing craft beer that seems <laughs> to bring out the worst people <laughs> <laughs> but you know maybe we wouldn't need to serve like 11 different varieties of uh of of uh uh, you know, detergent that basically all do the same thing. So yeah. those that that sort of thing, pro those sort of priorities would be would be different. But would we still have detergent? Yes, of course we would still have detergent. Yeah. And the crucial thing here is that because there are a lot of environmentalists um, on the sort of degrowth um, or austerity ecology, eco austerity kind of um, end of things, which I critique in my my first book. And they sort of do have this anti-consumerist perspective that uh, we consume too much stuff. We don't need all these things. And um, 
um, it's um, it, it it's missing the it's missing the heart of the problem, which is the the, the market incentive to create bad things. If there's uh, good things um, that people people need, I mean, everybody night likes a little bit of color in their lives. We need not just bread but roses too. And one of the main criticisms, internal criticisms, of people from within the Soviet Union um, uh, was that. You know, it's great that we've got these, well, not great, but I mean, there's terrible things about the Soviet Union. I'm, I'm fervent anti-Stalinist, but, um, you know, okay, so you built um, steel mills and, 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 and coal mines um, and railroads and you electrified the entire country, but uh, there's no jeans uh, with zippers that work. There's no, we uh, there's, blue there's jeans. no rock and roll records, no pineapples, <laughs> um, you know. The, it was so gray. Wasn't that the great criticism of, so, of yeah. socialism? Sorry. It was so gray. I was telling a story earlier about my uh, my uncle. <laughs> and uh, my uncle was a commercial fisherman, and he'd meet uh, a Soviet uh, uh, fisherman out in the, the ocean. And they they uh, they bring, like, a stack of blue jeans and pineapples. Right. And that was the thing I couldn't remember. So thank you. <laughs> for my, yeah. And they, they just, like, meet in the ocean. And they get, like, bottles of vodka. And my, my cousin had all these, like, uh, Soviet Union trinkets. Uh, it was, like, you know. Rocking the tanky look in '89. Uh, so it, it was. Uh, Listen, you know. we love we love the trains, but the fact that we have no blue jeans. Uh, <laughs> it's actually we joke about it, but it was it was really really a, cru a crucial thing that people desperately wanted to to trade to to get uh, the je blue jeans illegal to get the rock and roll records illegally. Um, and we've got to remember that that's what these eco austerity people are promising, saying that basically the same thing as the Stalinist uh, leaders that you don't you don't need this. This is this is unimportant. Uh, that's my terrible Russian accent there. Uh, mine wasn't mine wasn't good either. But <laughs> I, I know um, Michael Brooks uh, a while back since we've been all thinking about him uh, this week. Uh, he he uh, said something like, um, you know, I want everybody to have uh, access. You know, I want everybody to be able to buy uh, to afford to buy Nikes. Yeah, and have exactly. them not be made in a sweatshop yeah. in in my socialist future. Yeah. yeah, and I and I think that's point. I think point A of my conception exactly. of socialism uh, is is Michael saying it's not that I don't want like because Michael was always wearing Adidas. Like you know what I mean? Like it's not like Michael was like you know uh, one of one of the the socialists that are that were like, hey, I don't even want to wear any like brands. Like Michael loved his fucking Adidas tracksuits, like as did Fidel Castro, which is kind of funny. But um, anyway, so uh. You know, the thing that Michael would say is like, it, it, I want everyone to have access to better things. Like, we, we're not going to win anybody else. We're not going to win more people by saying we want everyone to have worse things. Like, yeah. we want everyone, we want more people to have nice, like, like good, good things and to have like luxury and to have a nice life. Like, so that was, I think that's point A on my conception of, uh, of, of what socialism could be. And then point B is obviously the People's Republic of Walmart thing that I referenced, which is the distribution chain. So it, it I think those things both uh, radically uh, transformed me from someone that, you know, I was, um, I mean, I grew up with, with parents that were, you know, pretty, I mean, like hippie parents. And I went to like a hippie, uh, like, like school when I was a lot younger. And like, so a lot of times my conception of, of what, you know, the left was, was more of like a liberal, like, come on, man. Like, you know, like we don't have to wear all these brands and these logos and like the, like the rejection of that. And it's like, but, but like, I like those things. Too, not necessarily the the brands or like the logos part of it but like i want to have night like i don't want to have bad things and we constantly as socialists are told that like oh we're, we're creating a system that you aren't going to have nice things you're not going to have you know, things aren't going to be nice anymore things like you said are going to be gray and for for 40 yeah. years for 40 years working people across the west have suffered through um uh, wage constraints uh which is uh, you know this is what thatcher and reagan um, uh, uh, Mulroney in Canada help, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, Cole in, in, in Germany, all these, these neoliberal figures, that's what they wanted to do. That was the primary aim, is to keep down wages. There are other aspects as well in terms of privatization um, and liberalization of sort of like energy systems and stuff like that, but primarily it was about um, constraining wages. And for 40 years, that has largely been successful um, from their perspective. Um, there's been constraint in wages. In some um, parts of, of the Western economy, wages have actually declined. It does depend. Some sectors have increased, but overall, the standard of living has not really um, increased. And as we know, in the United States in particular, um, just ahead of the pandemic, for the very first time since the Second World War, 
uh, the uh, life expectancy actually declined, which is mind blowing. Yeah. And, and deaths um, of despair and deaths of despair went up drastically as soon as that. Like like uh, you know as like because you know there's different like there's different kinds of death. Like obviously we we could live like under capitalism. Like you know there's isn't very much regard for life. But the deaths of despair thing. It, you know, yeah. as like life expectancy decline, and a bigger percent of it are suicides, drug overdoses, like. Th- and so things. much of this comes down to to financial struggles, and so um, if we are if we are saying, as a result of sort of our in, uh, our mistaken environmental consciousness, uh, mistaking actually what the cause of environmental pro- problems problems are, we're telling working people, the mass of working people across the West, that we all consume too much. Yeah. After forty years of not. The bear of, of struggling to buy stuff, we're telling these people, you know, follow us, we promise less. It is a recipe for the for uh, no, absolutely nobody voting for socialism. And yeah. this isn't what we, we, we mean anyway. I think this is a this is a cuckoo's nest in the ne- uh, cuckoo's egg in the nest of the left. It's not what we're about. If you're yeah. on a picket line and the workers are fighting for higher wages and they win and we want them to win, what are those workers going to do? They're going to buy more stuff. So it's, yeah, it, there's just this sort of intellectual disconnect. Um, uh, telling lots people, and lots of, um, under okay, neoliberalism, it's you seems... you know you want higher wages, but don't spend those higher wages. Yeah, <laughs> under neoliberalism, it seems like these disconnects are are created emphatically, like these almost like logical black holes. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's definitely one of them in in the response to it. But it's also very interesting um, that you that you said uh, you know it, like sacrificing things like. It's interesting that neoliberalism obviously starts kind of under Carter. Like Carter is really, I think, the the first like the first truly neoliberal figure, and it's yep. you know his his uh, his austerity his austerity is personal austerity, which is kind of a crazy thing because Reagan you know Reagan is obviously our our, our neoliberal revolution president. You know what I mean? Like he's kind of the person that seems like the central figure. But before him, Carter's, you know, his main thing was uh, sacrifice, sacrifice. You need to sacrifice. And of course, wages went with that. But, you know, it's also sacrifice consumption. So if the response to that is, once again, sacrifice consumption, we're trying to, you know, uh, claim that we are both, we are both fighting, like we're, we started neoliberalism under an austerity economy and we're kind of continuing, we're going to end neoliberalism under a, a austerity economy. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, austerity doesn't feel any better if it is like um, painted green. Yeah. Sorry, Andy. Andy I know. Yeah, I, 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 really I was. I was going to say something. Just saying, like, uh, uh, you know, to put it in terms of like music, so people can kind of understand it too. Um, you know, Carter was like television, and, and uh, Reagan was like the Sex Pistols. You know. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to continue out that analogy. That'd make Iggy Pop Richard Nixon. No, you will not do that to Iggy. <laughs> friend of good friend of show Iggy Pop. I love Iggy Pop. We we played we played the Iggy Pop uh video, didn't we? Um the other day for Repo Man. Remember when he's talking about how he met <laughs> Yeah. Um if you can actually get Iggy Pop on, on your show, but you know at that point you totally made it. Yeah. It'd be amazing. I can see what I can do. I, I got connections in the music industry. I, huh? Yeah. I'm not my dad, my dad, uh, heroes, though. Then he'd come on and be like, "Well, oh, fucking capitalism is awesome." <laughs> <laughs> my my dad yeah, worked as a in, in the city for an architecture firm. He now he works he works for himself now and designs like those uh, really bougie uh, um, green like greenhouses, which is very it's very good that those exist. But the fact that you know only rich people can really afford green architecture it kind of fucking sucks. Yeah. Um, like you know brings us back to that point. Like you know green like green housing for all and, and my dad's not opposed to that or anything but like that's what he wanted to do he was like you know i, I remember he dragged me to go see um i mean not drag me like it was a good it's good uh it was a good moment i guess for the for the human race but al gore doing the uh inconvenient truth documentary he dragged me to that five times <laughs> when i was when it first came out in different movie theaters um i don't i don't think al gore's response to it is the right response obviously yeah. he's a centrist but you know the fact that we know that now, and it's not like just some memo in a in a Exxon Mobil desk that like you know that that's existed since the seventies that nobody's like ever bothered to ask about. You know what I mean? That that's that's kind of or, or leak uh, <laughs> is kind of I think why it was a good moment for humanity in the sense of like at least now we know the problem. Of course, the solution isn't what any 
fucking centrist Democrat is going to make the solution. But, you know. Well, I mean, uh, um, it's complicated. Um, uh, I do think that um, the Biden is not going far, far enough, fast enough um, with respect to decarbonizing the economy. Um, at the same time, some of the suite of technologies that um, his administration is proposing that we do more research and development with respect uh, respect to climate change and um, incentivize the, the build out of, um, I think these are some of the, uh, the correct technologies that, that we will need for deep decarbonization. My problem primarily is that it's always about incentivization rather than a direct state build out or creative new government public agencies to, to be doing this. That's where my criticism um, lies, not the set of technologies. And ironically, um, I have some pretty severe criticisms of some of the sort of green left or the climate left uh, folks where they will be focusing almost exclusively on variable renewable energies, like solar and wind. Um, yeah, and I, um, I actually, I actually uh, edited the the clips or clips from uh when you had the jacobin debate about um nuclear, nuclear energy. power Nu yeah yeah so, so, so i, I about, was the one that just about nuclear it's also things like um ultimately we'll be needing some form of carbon capture and storage if we want to de uh, want to stabilize um or reduce um um, um atmospheric uh, carbon uh, dioxide concentrations back to a to an optimum level for human flourishing and much of the green left is like just straight up opposed to carbon capture and storage and direct air capture regardless. Rather, what, what I would say is we have to be careful to make sure that carbon capture and storage isn't used um, as an excuse not to uh, sunset fossil fuel industries. Uh, we need to be doing it as well as, but I think that's where the struggle is, not that we shouldn't uh, be doing uh, carbon capture and storage or direct air capture. And similar things yeah. like no, I was just going to just interject. Like I, I was on Barnes blog uh, yesterday and um, uh, I, I uh, made this comment at the end, you know, we need to be thinking of not just the long-term goals and we can't forget the long-term goals, you know, but we also need to be thinking of those short-term goals to make those long-term goals possible. Yep. Uh, so, so carbon capture is a great short-term goal and uh, you know, yeah, liberals might get all excited about that and we can actually team up together with people who, who think that that's the be all end all and get that done so then we can start the next fight and get them primed for you know the failures of what carbon capture is because you know it's it's it's, yeah, it's a step say, in the right direction but not the answer i would i would say just do both at the same time um, um but another example along these lines and it fits with these sorts of technologies as well um is we know that it's going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to decarbonize, or so rather to electrify um, long haul shipping and long haul aviation. Um, mainly because, like, I mean, a number of different reasons, but basically, you don't have, there's no, there are no recharging stations in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's more complicated than that. I mean, basically, uh, that you know, length of trajectory, length of journey, uh, by that point, the, the, the scale of the batteries that you're going to be needed, you're, it's so voluminous um, that basically it takes up the entire ship and all that you're doing there is you're just moving a massive battery back and forth. So we know that we're going to need some sort of clean fuels instead of electricity there. Whether, we don't know exactly what that's going to be, uh, whether that's going to be um, synthetic hydrocarbons uh, where we draw down carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere and produce hydrogen cleanly um, maybe from um, using advanced heat sources from ge advanced use thermal or from dedicated nuclear reactors that only produce high quality heat, not electricity, um, but whatever, you know, and, and just create uh, carbon neutral um, fuels that will still look and, and smell. And as far as the, the internal combustion engines are concerned, they, they'll be running on the same fuels. It's just at this time that they're, uh, they're carbon neutral or they, it could be ammonia some challenges technologically with developing that. Well, there's technological challenges with developing all these different things, but we need to get on that stuff right away. We can't wait um, until 2030 to be developing our, um, uh, our heavy transport fuels. Um, and the thing is that there's a lot of people in the Biden administration that know that. Even if I don't prefer their, uh, uh, their 
policy or the suite of economic policies to achieve that, they're not wrong about the technology. Whereas a lot of the green green left or climate left don't even know that this is an issue. Like, I mean, their solution to aviation is just no aviation. Like, yeah. Stop it. Well, yeah, and, and that and that gets how us back are people going to fly from Hawaii to uh, to the mainland? How are they going to send their elected representatives to Congress or their uh, union leaders to some um, uh, general meeting? That and that brings us back to like the austerity economy points yeah. that you were making, like the the fact that you know you're not going to win anybody over by saying you're going to have less less things that you rely on. Like that's not how you win people over. And the other thing I think I wanted to bring up with this is like the and and then I want to go back to Ad Astra to, to close yeah, out. <laughs> Do you, do, you have, do you have do you have like uh 20 more minutes or 15 more minutes yeah, or something sure. yep. okay um this this guy like i don't know i wish i wish we could have this conversation for like you know like like hours to be honest because it's like, Thanks. but yeah <laughs> but um so i think that the just transition is extremely important too um as and and in different sectors and i think it gets focused on a lot in in oil but like it's gonna have to get focused on um, to some degree with shipping probably too. And like, you know, all, like all of everything that really requires oil and everything that really requires, uh, you know, incredibly wasteful fuels to some degree for a little bit is going to have to require some kind of just transition. And the fact that, you know, a lot of, uh, both a lot of, I mean, centrists don't give a fuck, like centrist, like Democrats and, and centrist, uh, you know, even like, even like some of the more liberal Republicans, they don't really exist as much anymore, but like, there's still some that acknowledge that climate change is a problem. And you know their their solution is going to be like learn to code the fucking Rahman manual thing yeah. like so that's not a real solution so I think it is important to understand that you know and and that this gets to the distribution point again that, that we were talking about like uh, people are gonna are going to transition into jobs in other fields that are more renewable and it's important that that point gets brought up by the left and it doesn't seem like a lot of people a lot of the climate like the the ego I guess the eco socialists don't seem to really be that concerned about that um, and, and making that point and making that justification for it. Nobody's going to vote for you if they think their job's going to go away. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. The, uh, the climate left's version of learn to code is uh, embedded in a lot of their Green New Deal proposals. And I actually support a Green New Deal. I just don't uh, support the technologies that, or not all the technologies that they're proposing there. Um, uh, their version of uh, learn to code is um, slap um, solar panels on roofs and stuff insulation in building retrofits, both of which are unskilled jobs. At best, you're going to be earning, you know, sixteen dollars an hour, um, and they're not—they're uh, not permanent. They're temporary jobs. Still, they, 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 once those those things are done, those jobs are gone. Whereas, some of the things that I was just talking about in terms of a serious uh, consideration of how we're going to. Um, start producing synthetic hydrocarbons um, or ammonia fuels. Um, if you're a pipe fitter at the moment in the gas industry, in the uh, natural gas industry, or pipe fitter um, in the, uh, the the oil industry, it doesn't really matter whether what's flowing through that pipeline is natural gas or synthetic carbon neutral gas. You still need those those pipe fitters. Yeah, and those pipe fitters are earning, you know. 70,000, 80,000, maybe 120,000 a year. These are good family supporting jobs. This is, these are the kind of jobs that existed in the 50s where one person could work and that would you know, be enough for a family. Um, that's what we're fighting for. And if um, so we really need to be very, very aware of not just what will work best in terms of a rapid de decarbonization, but also what sort of jobs really do deliver a just transition. Uh, and we don't end up doing in, unintentionally making the same issuing the same line, you know, learn to code. But in this case, it's slap solar panels on roofs. Well, and, and Bernie did a really good job with his uh, federal jobs guarantee um, idea, which was that, you know, like whether or not uh, we're, we're in a, in a more of like a far more green economy, we're still going to need to overhaul the infrastructure. Um, in our entire society, oh, and for sure. that's that's a temp that might be a, a somewhat temporary thing, but that's still you know a good amount of time. That if we're you know if we're taking if we're put, like pouring money into infrastructure and then um, like refitting everything to be way more green, uh, the, a lot of that is going to require the same kinds of work as you know fixing the infrastructure the way we do it now, but it's going to be in a different type of technology, which 
Bernie was making a really good point that like make the point that you're like it's not that we're taking away jobs, we're adding infrastructure jobs. Like that's the point that's going to have to, you know. I mean it does depend what we're talking about. We do have to get into the nitty gritty of, of what's in the policies there. And as much as I love Bernie, um, I mean, I've got my Bernie mug like on my desk here behind um, the, my, my computer. I'm definitely all in for Bernie. Um, I do think that his climate policies, uh, they were far too captured by this sort of eco austerity left um, that he wasn't paying enough attention to both um, the evidence and the science with respect to what will actually, uh, what set of climate solutions would de deliver a rapid uh, deep decarbonization, wasn't paying enough attention to problems with respect to maintaining um, a firm supply of electricity on the grid, and wasn't really paying much attention to um, the kinds of high quality, uh, high paid, high skill, family supporting jobs for the just transition. Um, but obviously, because I think there are many other in issues that are uh, as important, or if not more important than climate change. Um, I was like, I'll, I'll overlook that because these other issues are broadly, and I, I would hope to try to win Bernie and his supporters to a, a more coherent uh, position with respect to uh, climate uh, solutions. I, I guess, think we're beginning to see yeah. that now. Um, like um, Jacobin, um, even Novara in the UK, um, are putting putting out um, arguments in favor of nuclear power. Um, there was a great um, discussion on Doug Henwood's uh, podcast a couple of days ago, maybe a week ago, with Christian Parenti making a defense of carbon capture and storage. And no, none of these people you could say are are not left wing. You know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Eva Morales, uh, Lula da Silva, uh, AOC supports nuclear. Um, all, all these people support nuclear. So there's something really changing now um, where I think we're beginning to win this argument amongst uh, amongst folks. Because people do want solutions. I don't think, I don't think most people want to be eco-austerity leftists. Like, yeah. it just seems like we're reaching such an insurmountable point that, like, people are like, we have to put it like, like this, like, and, and I think a lot of this also comes from, um, like, an 80s and 90s and early 2000s conception of what the left can really do. And at that point, it's really... The, the, the point that everyone was making wasn't we're going to win political power it's everything is becoming really corporatized we need to put the we need to, to stop it while it's happening but now yeah. it's happened and now we kind of have more of a chance to win real political power and it, it kind of sucks that you know uh policies are not really put at the forefront necessarily of a lot of um election cycles because i just i just like the bernie was making a point about there needing to be um statements about a just transition anyway you know what i mean like oh yeah yeah it wasn't totally. Like, I don't think if he got into the nitty gritty of it on, on like a, like in a debate, like everyone would have just been like, all right, well, let's, let's start talking about Russia again. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so it makes it really hard. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, I want everyone's quality of life to go up. I am against austerity yeah, yeah. In, in any form and eco austerity. Like, you know, I, I, it's, it's austerity. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't change the fact that that's exactly what it is. But um, I guess I wanted to, like since you know since it's getting towards that time to go back to ad astra which right I, <laughs> um i wanted to ask you uh i thought this would be an interesting question i guess to close out with what do you think was the least and i'll ask andy too but what do you think was the least uh believable or the least uh scientific part of the film itself like do you think it was the space baboons which no 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 the space baboons i mean uh that it was just a, a weird episode that seemed to be um, uh, out, out of joint with the rest of the the, the, the narrative. Um, no, it's the, the the primary threat to the Earth is are these cosmic rays um, emerging from um, uh, from Neptune to heading towards the Earth. And there's one point where you know there's this major general or lieutenant general or whatever lieutenant general. Sorry, uh, I remember it's American audience here. Lieutenant general um, says. And the cosmic rays are getting stronger and stronger as they closer to Earth. Um, yeah, <laughs> and that's just not how. Well, it's because they were, came from the it came from the the antimatter. Get away, so, the weaker. Uh, yeah, LB. it's called, called the inverse square law. Um, yeah, no, that, but that, that just logically that makes sense. But you know, it's it's antimatter, so everything's backwards, and uh, you know the rules of physics don't matter anymore. I they they explained it really weirdly too. They're like, oh, his ship is powered by antimatter, and he probably lost control, and like 
the fuel is sending like i don't know it was a very weird and then they're like but it's also him trying to communicate like he's sending a text and it like the text is just maybe maybe the text gets angrier and angrier as it goes it just he's like he's like <laughs> <I need help!" laughs> yeah, I, it was that sort of uh wibbly wobbliness um uh of of that that was that was the worst but i thought but it's also i mean how much of it how much of it is realistically though i guess th this is this is the defense i'll give of this because yeah. i could like i'll counterpoint it Spacecom, it seems like, is incredibly realistically treated as almost like an intelligence agency, like the same way the CIA is. Like they're covering up the fact that this guy is essentially a, a space dictator. They're covering up all this different stuff. Their true intentions, like everything, is 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 classified. It's a, it's kind of a it's a space intelligence agency at that point, like yeah. less than it is a scientific one. So how much of that is just their bullshit? Where they're like, oh, it's getting stronger. When really the point of why they're trying to hunt him down isn't the cosmic rays; is that they want to have him liquidated. Yeah, but that's not that's not a sort of question of scientific accuracy. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm just that was my I guess that was my counterpoint for um, the movie itself. Like, how much can you really believe that comes from uh, the the? I mean, I um, I really liked its attempt at high realism. Um, it's far from perfect, um, but. Um, there's been this suite of uh, sort of hard science fiction films in the last few years, uh, Interstellar, Gravity, um, High Life, um, uh, Ad Astra, uh, Missing Some. Um, um, and they've made a, a really good attempt. There's always issues. You're never going to get it perfect. And to some extent, you can sort of allow a little bit um, of, of artistic license just so it does, doesn't go all the way to sort of you know, Star Wars or, or Avengers, where uh, there's science is just basically a, a prop. And a, a, there's not, not even any attempt to having any sort of scientific accuracy. I'd, I'd argue space that magic. It's space yeah, I'd, magic. I'd, I'd argue that Star Wars isn't a science fiction film. I'd argue that Star Wars is a, yeah. is a, is a fantasy film in yeah. the vein. I mean, you know, George Lucas is obviously incredibly uh, inspired by Joseph Campbell, which so is, um, you know, you know, so is James Gray, but in different ways, I guess. Um, it seems like it seems like uh, Star Wars is a lot more like something like Wizard of Oz than it is uh, yeah. like a science Absolutely. fiction. Absolutely, it's a yeah. fantasy, film. <laughs> and Avengers is fantasy. Um, uh, Avengers is 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 CIA propaganda, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a conversation. <laughs> I, I I always find it very strange uh, to find those uh, like um, I guess. He, well, no, you don't. Would have the. You, there's no such thing as a uh, a video store anymore. But certainly online on on Netflix or whatever, that they'll be categorized in the science fiction section, and they're not at all. They're fantasy. They're space fantasy. Yeah, I wish there was a better. Uh, I guess a better term than science fiction because science fiction kind of makes it sound like science. Like you can you could be like, well, it is science fiction. There's you know it's it, it's fictional. Like you know what I mean. Like I wish there was like a realistic cosmic cosmic fiction i would say or something like well, that well the, the, the terms that people would usually use or critics would use, or fans would use is the distinction between hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi yeah so um uh, ad astra interstellar uh gravity those are hard sci-fi but even with hard sci-fi it doesn't mean that everything's absolutely always scientifically accurate there may be some little uh, bits and pieces, but generally they try to aim towards uh, scientific accuracy. Um, but then, yeah, the other ones would be soft, uh, soft sci-fi, or even as we've just said, said like space fantasy. I think there, like Doctor Who, would be a good example of where, sort of the old Doctor Who, there would be serials which really lean towards uh, hard sci-fi with some weird aspects that are not scientific and accurate and then other ones which were just nothing but space fantasy and then you would have um star trek which is totally hard sci-fi sci hard sci-fi uh except that there's a handful of um things that are just completely not realistic at all within science and even the science that we knew in the 1960s um and they're just in they're put in there mainly because it would be hard to film otherwise like things around gravity um and certainly the warp drive uh, that's impossible I really i really 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 love uh 2001 the space odyssey's treatment of uh basically making it like the ship is powered by them running like people having to run around basically a giant hamster wheel like <laughs> that was like inspired by rc clark inspired that by like actual technology you know what i mean like 
that he conceived of. Like, I think Arthur C. Clarke is probably the most, um, he, like when it comes to like hard side, like he's, he's the most, uh, a lot of times most accurate because he literally was, um, he, he was involved in that field. Like, you know what I mean? So like, Arthur C. Clarke is totally yeah. hard sci-fi. Yeah. Isaac Asimov, hard sci-fi. Um, uh, many of the great, uh, like, like within the, the sort of literature books, uh, you can be uh, fairly easily um, straightforwardly hard sci-fi because you aren't constrained by budgets or the infeasibility of filming um, uh, low gravity environments or, or, or anything like that because it's just on the page. The, yeah. uh, the, the lack of scientific accuracy creeps in at large years as a result of the inability to um, get that across um, in film. But now, which I think this is one of the interesting things is that because in recent years uh, we have such amazing um, abilities to uh, to tell stories in a way that we never could before um, in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, I mean, that's allowing fantastical storytelling on the level of Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, but is also allowing us now finally to have some pretty hard science fiction but even there there's still some some limits but in the i, I think we're we're enter, entering a period where we're going to see a lot more um hard sci-fi filmic and televisual televisual representations simply because we can now yeah and i, I think that's why i mean and, and andy i'll let you go i'll let you go uh, uh on this question after after i get done with this statement i guess but um the, like one of the most you're muted um, I do that. Most, <laughs> no, I, so one of the most interesting, I mean, things about Arthur C. Clarke specifically in 2001 is that we really did not know that much about what the, the universe looked like. Like, obviously you could see, you know, we had telescopes, we had satellites, we had, you know, a few of these things, but in uh, 1964 at the World's Fair, I'm pretty sure it was the year that um the, the, they had like the first, like the first couple of realistic. And I think it was uh, your home, your home nation of Canada, the, the first uh, <laughs> World's Fair, uh, the Canadian Canadian version of like NASA, like uh, they they created what was pretty much the most accurate at the time um, movie showing us the universe. Um, which you know, people that ended the up world's, the World's Fair in 1986. No, 1964. 1964. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll double check that. I was around. I just no, know the no. Expo 67 song, but that's a whole other story. Oh, that's yes, right. Expo 67. Um, was, that Montreal? was that Montreal? Yes, it was. Okay. So <laughs> Kubrick and, and Arthur C. Clarke, I'm pretty sure it was 1964, sent um, sent people, sent like their like like writers that were writing with them to the World's Fair um, to, to collect stuff. And they ended up getting a copy of this uh, this documentary, or not documentary, but like the, the science, the most scientifically accurate film. Um, at the time of like what the universe would look like, like it was designed obviously by a team in Canada, I think of um, of both uh, uh, you know filmmakers and, and and scientists, and they were really like a lot of the way that they conceived of what the universe would look like um, was this film. So Arthur C. Clarke was really, I mean, and also he had connections at NASA. Obviously, he was like you know he's involved in the British uh, the, the British astronomy, like so all of that stuff before he started writing. But they they have these two films, I think, that they really conceive of this. And it's interesting that now we can kind of, we have so much more imaging. We know what things look like, you know, when it comes to filmmaking, like the aesthetics of it. Like we know what a lot of, like we know what pretty much every planet that we want to looks like. Like we can guess what the terrain of it is. Like at, at the time, I think uh, with, with Arthur C. Clarke and Kubrick, they were kind of, it was like a best guess. So as these things sure. get, as these things get um, brought down, I think the, the questions, I think, of, of sci-fi, like hard sci-fi, get more specific. Like we start having questions about climate change. We start having questions about, you know, the un like the universe and, and specific uh, areas of it and the details get better. So it's, it feels like 2001 was kind of created um, conceptually as like, you know, the, the best, the best picture that we really uh, could come up with at the time. And they were, they were amazing about um, ideas that, that, you know, later, like they have the tablets that they're, watching the news on in, in the which you know decades before we have ipads or anything like that but oh yeah like, given given the yeah. enormous constraints uh that filmmakers were under in 1969 i think it's 1960 i think i think it's before that even it was 68 68 
Because because uh, 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 Space Oddity by David Bowie came out the following year. Yeah, 19, 1968. Okay. But I think they were working on it for like four years. They, like it was an so extremely yeah, long. I was going to say that um, it's amazing how accurate it was, uh, given the enormous constraints that filmmakers were on under back then. Uh, yeah. compared to today but you know what that's going to be the, the case in 50 years from uh, from now as well that the films if we still have films if they don't turn into some sort of combination between films and video games or something like who knows what's going to happen i think there will still always be narrative but who knows i guess i uh, mixed up the two things the national film board of canada's 1960 animated short documentary universe and then another one was the 1964 uh new york world fair uh movie to the to the moon and beyond there we and, go so, NFB, National Film Board, yeah. great piece of Canadian <laughs> socialism, um, public uh, film agency. Yep, gave money uh, to dentists to make softcore porn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just going to say that, like in fifty years' time, we'll be looking back on Ad Astra and Interstellar and Gravity and saying, "Oh, it's so clunky." I I don't think two thousand one is clunky though. That's why I think it's one of the most brilliant pieces of of, of filmmaking. Like obviously there's yeah. big there's holes that we've uh, that we've not the same way the dentist did maybe, but holes we've filled in um, <laughs> <laughs> since then. But I, I don't I think I think considering how much constraint they were under, like two thousand one is an amazing movie. Like the detail that they really crafted has yeah. proved like. I mean, I don't know. There's a really, there's a really good making of documentary where they kind of go into like a lot of the technology, and a lot of it was being developed at the time. Some of it didn't necessarily, like the video phones, were something that Bell was developing. Like, there's all these interesting ideas of things that were being developed. That um, even uh, the the really weirdly the the Hal uh, when he sings that song at the end of um, when when he's being killed was an actual song. The first uh, the first quote unquote AI that they really really taught to like communicate. That was the song that they taught it, and uh, oh. Arthur C. Clarke knew that because he had connections at NASA, and and so like even down to that detail is insane. So when he says like, "Oh, I was programmed to say like, here's a song that I was singing at the at the dawn of conception," that's because that's because um, the first AI was like taught that song, and, and they're li literally like doing an homage to it that people aren't necessarily going to know like years later. I'll have to um, read up on that. Yeah. So uh, I guess Andy, I'll, I'll ask you the same question though. What do you think is the least, the least, uh, the least scientifically accurate, or something that you had a problem with that? Because we we talked about a lot of positive things with that Astra. So. Yeah, it's a small thing, but it, it's right at the very end. Whenever um, Brad Pitt climbs up on that rotor and then uh, you know basically surfs off the rotor and uses that as a shield, um, I, I I always like um, I understand inertia, like you know works as an object in motion, stays in motion, but he's crashing into objects at rest, which would slow his, uh, you know, his speed down. And at some point he might actually run out of, of inertia going through the belt of um, uh, Uranus like that. And, and, and so uh, uh, like, like I always like, like, but the, the, the rotor wasn't going that fast. So, you know, how much inertia could he actually have to surf over there and, um, you know, get, get I, you know, I don't know. I have lots of questions about that. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, watch the, the rest of it tonight after I finish this. <laughs> yeah. It's just like a exactly small thing. Happened. And it just like, like bugged me because like everything was supposed to be so scientifically accurate. And like, he never seemed to slow down in the, uh, uh, right. you know, going through the belt. So, yeah, so uh, I was just uh, like, Hmm. I guess, I guess mine well, is someone that, I mean, okay. I'll uh, have to yeah. think about it a bit. Like, um, he was using his jetpack a little bit, but like you know, again, how much? Uh, yeah. How how much speed is that? You know, actually is, giving. He's him? in. Is he in? A, I don't remember the uh, the the sort of sequence. Is he in a vacuum at that point? Yeah, it was after he he cuts ties with uh uh you know uh, Tommy Lee Jones, a and uh. Well, uh, if you're in a vacuum, you're you're not going to slow down. Yes, but if you're hitting rocks while you're flying through it. Yep. True. True. Which is yep. why he had the uh. He 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 surfed. He basically yeah. surfed off the thing. I mean, you see him like undo the the bolts and then use the uh, inertia from the spinning of the uh, of the rotor to to come off of that. So so that's where he got his initial speed from. Which you know the rotor wasn't going that fast, but you know still he's got he's got some inertia. He's got some speed, and then he used the uh, the plate that he was surfing on as a shield so a rock wouldn't crack his uh, his visor. All right, I'll 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 have enough. It's it's a it's a watch. actually great scene overall. It just you know well, at least it isn't like um when in uh was it tomorrow never dies that um 
James Bond film where James Bond like surfs a tsunami. Yes. <laughs> also CIA prop. No. But, but <laughs> uh, it reminded me also. <laughs> the other thing that the, the scene kind of jumped out at me it reminded me of the uh, end of Dark Star. If you uh, ever saw that one, so what a John Carpenter. But people who re- uh, like people love it. Oh, it's. I haven't seen it since I was a kid. So, so l- let me just tell you from my kid's point of view. Um, I thought it was great. It's it's John Carpenter's first movie. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's flawed. I mean, like they had an alien that was just a beach ball with feet, and then it gets deflated, and like this guy starts crying over it. it <laughs> that's all I really remember. That and the surfing at the end. I well, I love John Carpenter. He's great. Yeah, no, and it's uh the the guy who did the special effects is like um went on to have like a really big career in Hollywood too. Uh, worked in I think it was Rob Botton, if I remember correctly from RoboCop. Okay. And um, I mean, the thing, the thing is one of my favorite. Films. Yes, love the thing. Have um, you seen the forest? Have you seen the uh, thing? Yeah, a and long, the thing don't surf. Ago, we were gonna redo. We were gonna redo. We were gonna have a John Carpenter watch through on Ben's show, uh, and we. I mean, hopefully, we still will at some point. But um, it was gonna be fun doing that. Um, one, I guess, I guess my my answer to this question uh, before before we just uh, sign off of the the broadcast part of it. Is uh is the space baboons and the space pirates? It was weird that that they never came back up again. I mean, we talked about that uh, before we were filming, but like we were streaming. But it's just it's just weird they never explained that, and it was just kind of like quickly like it seemed like it seemed like the, the space baboons were a uh, homage to uh to uh Planet of the Apes or something where you know they were just like oh like these could conceivably become experiments that went terribly wrong and uh c- like colonize their own area and. But then they like they killed them, and then they were like, "All right, well, we're not going to explain that." And he's back on the ship, and he's like, "Yeah, the captain died. I don't know." And then the other one is like the space pirates fighting over resources. Like, it, like we never even really see them. They're just kind of there shooting at them, and it's like, "You're going to introduce the concept of space pirates, and you're not going to give us a second to be like, oh, cool, space pirates.' You're just going to like, it's it's done, and it's like, all right." <laughs> Yeah, because shouldn't they have captured Brad Pitt and then they had to get ransom back? And you know, that would have been an exciting middle. Yeah, they arc. cut, they cut, and he's kind of like faster than them, and then they cut, and he's like, he's like, Yeah, the guy like passed. It's like, all right, like you're just gonna gloss over the whole all of this. Yeah, it wasn't a perfect film by any, I don't even I don't know if I would even say it was a great film. I think it was a very profound film. Yeah. Um I um, I loved the cinematography. I thought uh, Hoyt Ben Hoytma, um, Hoytma, how we pronounce his name, uh, this, it was amazing. Um, this high realist um, uh, lighting, and I thought the acting was really good. I thought you know Brad Pitt was fantastic, really really good. This sort of how do you portray a uh, basically unemotional uh, figure? that doesn't just look like you're not acting. And he does it really yeah. well. He's There's so many aspects of it that I really, I thought the themes were fantastic. The music by uh, Max Richter, amazing score. Um, but uh, the whole um, is uh, less than the sum of its parts. It's, um, doesn't yeah, it seems like come a together. Great, great attempt, mediocre landing is, yeah. what, I, is yeah. what I'd say. Andy, how do you, uh, do you have a do you have a final uh, analysis like a, like whatever concluding thought about it? Yeah, it, it just seemed like uh, they were trying to build a lived-in world, and in doing that, it opened up so many other boxes. Where where going back to uh, the example of of Outland, Outland, you know, didn't didn't try to bring in so many different other things. It focused on the the one story, but it also felt lived in because everything felt worn out um, much the same way kind of Star, you know, one of the great things about the set design of Star Wars, the original, uh, you know, was was that that lived in feel to it. Uh, And um, I don't necessarily think the movie felt lived in, but they were trying to do that with like space pirates and space monkeys. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't think that that space quite works. lions and space tigers and space bears. Oh my! Oh my. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna cut the the streaming part here. We can keep talking um, afterwards if you want. But uh, you know, I think that it's hard to make people pay attention for more than like an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, so. All right, this was this was great, and 
Lee, I hope you'll come back as our like sci- one of our sci-fi correspondents. Um, sci-fi correspondent, but, sure. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, because I, I want to watch more sci. Like, I feel like I haven't watched that many sci-fi movies. Like, I want to keep doing. Well, oh, I got a laundry list for you, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. All right, so uh, left is best. <laughs> Thank you.